that there is an increased efficiency and effectiveness in the investment of funds collected within the pensions. Number three, cabinet would love that the NSSF introduces new products. Number four, Cabinet would want to improve the governance at the fund. And number five, specifically, government would like to streamline the appointment of key staff in the fund. In line with the above principles, the cabinet has approved the key proposed amendments to the NSSF Act. There are a couple of them, about nine, and I will just go through them to share uh, with you what they are and what the implications are for our members. Number one, to specifically provide that the NSSF board shall be a tripartite arrangement and therefore will comprom comprise of government representatives, employers representatives, and workers representatives. In fact, this has already been happening in practice, but this is now being incorporated within the law uh, of the NSSF. Number two, to provide for the appointment of a managing director and the deputy managing director respectively by the minister on recommendation of the board on a contract of five years. The implication of this is that it strengthens the governance structure at the fund by enabling the board to be directly responsible for the actions of the management team. Furthermore, the longer tenure also implies that both the MD and the DMD are now able to accomplish their planned strategy, as opposed to the law when it allowed for a three-year contract and this was insufficient for sec strategy execution. Number three, to provide for the appointment of a s uh, corporation secretary who will be accountable to the board of directors. The corporation secretary would also be appointed by the board on a five-year contract that is renewable, subject to satisfactory performance. Number four, to provide for mandatory contributions for all workers, regardless of the size of their enterprise. This is a significant change because this proposal will increase the scope of coverage increasing the number of eligible employers and employees and it will now be mandatory for everyone to save as long as he or she is engaged in any form of gainful employment or any economic activity. This proposal replaces the provisions of the current act which, make the, um, which gives the law to the minister in pursuit of section 7.1 of the NSSF Act which currently limits the scope of coverage to only five employees uh, within a company, which effectively was denying uh, coverage to a significant chunk of employees. Number five, to provide for the voluntary contributions of workers over and above the mandatory contribution, uh, and also to allow for voluntary contributions by self-employed persons. The implication of this is that the proposed amendment will provide for voluntary contributions by persons in informal employment and also those in self-employment and those who are also willing to register and make contributions to the fund. Furthermore, it will allow for additional voluntary contributions by, by individuals who are already catered for under the mandatory scheme. Uh, let me just explain a little bit on this. So you already are registered with NSSF. You are currently contributing 15% of five by yourself and 10 by your employer, <coughs> but you want to make an extra contribution for yourself. This law will now allow you to contribute more. And this is a principle which will replace the current section 10 of the NSSF Act which only caters for employees of an eligible employer, i.e. who employs less than five em employees, and has also chosen a voluntary register and make contributions to employees. In addition, the proposed amendment under Section 7 has, been lifted, has lifted that limitation 
and will make the current section 10 redundant. This will also make it possible for fund members to plan for the kind of retirement they want. And they can therefore set some lifestyle targets and goals and execute them while they are working by providing an increase in the voluntary contribution that they make to the fund and while they are still employed. That was a mouthful, but we'll go on to number six. Number six is to give the board powers to introduce new products in consultation with the minister. Specifically, to provide for mid-term access of voluntary benefits on such conditions and terms as may be set by the board. This, I know, is a big one. And the implications is that once the bill is passed into an act, the board will now have powers to introduce new benefits, including but not lif limited to the housing benefit, the education benefit, and also the health benefit. The good news for our members is that it is an opportunity to access social security products and also services which are relevant throughout their life cycle as opposed to waiting for our traditional six benefits that the fund has been offering. This is the punchline, I believe. However, some of these new benefits may require our members to make an extra saving via a voluntary contributions in order to qualify for some of these benefits. And we can talk a little bit about that a little bit later on. Number seven is to provide the board with the discretion to use in-house expertise and fund managers instead of using external fund managers for management of the scheme. The implication is that now the board has a discretion to decide whether to hire externally or internally for fund managers. This is a welcome move for us because we believe that if we use in-house fund managers, it becomes a little bit uh, cheaper uh, and also uh, builds on our capacity to be able to improve the returns that we give to our members, but also can drive efficiencies uh, once those returns are made. And therefore, our members can be paid a higher interest rate than perhaps what we'll get out of external fund managers. Number nine, number eight, sorry, to allow the NSSF to lend to government. I know that this has been one of the controversial ones, but the implication of this is that the fund already lends to government through treasury bills and treasury bonds. The idea is to create a further framework where NSSF can lend to government using the same risk profile and return of a bond, but this will be targeted to specific product, projects. We are looking forward to playing a significant role in the economic development of Uganda, especially through the financing of much needed infrastructure, which we believe at the fund can uh, be achieved when the government especially issues infrastructure bonds. Number nine, to amend the act to include a provision of the amount of contribution any, uh, uh, and any other sum together with interest and penalty that may be recovered from a third party owing money to a defaulting employer. This amendment will provide for an employer who fails or refuses to remit contributions within a prescribed time, uh, they may have their business managed by a third party. Now, this sounds like a mouthful, but currently the fund only has one means of enforcing um, recoveries from an employer, and that is through the courts of law. What this proposed amendment to section 44, 3, and section 45 I intended to do is to introduce legal mechanisms to reinforce our existing provisions. These mechanisms are intended to provide alternative avenues of enforcement other than recourse to the courts, which should be our last resort. The implication of this is that our member now will have a more stringent measure in place for employers who 
are not compliant and therefore less to default. In conclusion, what do we expect to happen next? Number one, we now expect that the Minister of Gender, Labor and Social Development will proceed to issue instructions to the first Parliamentary Council to draft the NSSF uh, Amendment Bill 2018 in accordance with the principles that I've just enumerated. Number two, the bill will then be presented to Parliament and thereafter referred to the Parliamentary Committee for a discussion review. Number three, the committee will then present the revised bill to Parliament for debate and adoption. And thereafter, the approved bill will be submitted to Parliament for accent into a law. This is probably the best news our members have had since the creation of NSSF in 1987. And I would like to really, really encourage you to ask questions and continue the discussion and of course give feedback to our members of parliament because the next piece of legislation and discussion needs to take place within our parliament. Thank you so much. Thank you sir for <coughs> your elaborate uh, introduction to the matter. My name is Boris uh, Mogisha from uh, NTV uh, but I'm a shareholder. Um, my question is uh, based on the fact that we are waiting, awaiting contribution response from um, both members of the public and several other stakeholders um, who will be uh, presenting or allowed to present during the public sessions uh, their views on, this, uh, on these amendments. Um, I picked out a couple of things, uh, and it, it's true. Um, the biggest talkability or most of the talkability was around lending to government and it's good you've cleared the air on a couple of areas. But let me take you back to something you said about um, allowing you um, have internal fund managers. Uh, I, I wonder what's um, feasible for you, whether that, you know, it's, it's cost saving, but whether that's not a risk on your side to be able to build capacity internally to make good decisions for your um, uh, investors or those who actually serve with you, um, that internally you will then generate ideas, good ideas for the fund to invest in. Uh, wouldn't it be feasible and more um, uh, plausible to, in, to actually get external fund managers who will think um, ex exclusively for you um, uh, you know, in, in discussing where for the fund should invest? Uh, with the mindset of the fact that they are actually going to be paid to make good decisions? That's a very good question. Uh, let me give you some numbers. We currently pay our fund managers, our staff within the investment area, um, a cost of about a billion shillings a year. It would require us to pay about 0.5% uh, of our assets under management uh, to uh, our fund managers if we were to use an external fund manager. So if you look at uh, our current costs, um, our, current, our current, if you look at our current assets under management, they are 9.4 uh, trillion shillings. Now, if you are to find out that is equivalent to uh, about almost three or four billion shillings which we would have to incur uh, if we were to outsource our fund management. And the cost and the benefit does not really um, give us the comfort to make that decision. The other fact that we need to be aware of is that we are investing in the Ugandan market. The Ugandan market is largely dominated by uh, bonds. Uh, currently, we invest about 77% of our investments in government bonds. Um, the way you invest in a government bond is you bid based on the market. Um, and uh, that knowledge is largely available if you read the market very well. The second area of investment is obviously on the stock exchange. 
uh, currently we invest about 16-17% of our investments uh, within uh, equities, largely uh, within the East African market rather than in the Ugandan market, which is a much smaller stock exchange. Um, so we do use external fund managers, especially on some of the markets which we would like knowledge of and we are not uh, involved. For example, in the Kenyan market, we would have a couple of fund managers helping us on there. But I believe that uh, what the law currently says is that all investment has to be outsourced to a fund manager. And we think that the value of that is not exactly uh, in addition to the amount of uh, decisions that we need to make. So I think that if you look at the decision to allow us to have the flexibility of reviewing our portfolio and deciding what we should outsource and what we should deal with internally, I think that gives us the flexibility to make those decisions rather than having had a straight jacket, which basically means we can't do anything internally. But finally, I think uh, we are a fund, and that means that we are fund managers. So by having the capacity to build our fund manager capability, it means that we can train people, we can give them skills, we can um, let them you know, learn the tools of trade or fund management. And um, that means that we don't have a lot of risk in terms of um, you know, once we grow as a fund and become a lot bigger, we'll have be created the capacity to be able to do that also internally. So I think there are a lot of advantages of developing our own capacity, but also having the flexibility of using fund managers externally, especially in assets uh, which we might not have the expertise to invest in. Okay, so we've now received a couple of questions. Um, from um, uh, our members, I would assume. And one question is from Ronnie Lonex. What are the new proposed benefits the NSF would like to add? Um, largely, the housing benefit, um, the employment benefit, the unemployment benefit, the medical benefit, um, the funeral benefit. Uh, I believe that those would be some of the things that would be looking at. Run. Yes, of course we can see that um, most of the proposals being put forward are already in your 10 year strategic plan. Because when you are marking 30 years, you launched a very comprehensive strategic plan for 10 years. And I think most of these are catered for. Is there anything you need to adjust in your strategy plan to take care of these new changes? I think the big change for us will definitely come to uh, the way that we pay out benefits. Currently, our um, model is to pay out benefits in a lump sum. Um, I believe that some of the changes we need to consider uh, is um, pension, paying out pensions and paying it out annuities. Um, we currently do not have the capability of paying out annuities because those are products that are normally provided by an insurance company. So we need to uh, look at how we are able to provide those ones. The second um, change we need to make is to review uh, our actuarial value. And that means that Currently, a member saves 15%. Uh, that 15% is meant to cater for their retirement. Um, if we introduce or when we introduce the new benefits, will the 15% still be able to uh, cater for retirement and also midterm access? Uh, so one of the things we need to do is to do an, act an actuarial review uh, to establish which members are able to cater for both their current uh, requirement of uh, retirement, but also their future requirement of midterm access. And that would mean that perhaps um, increase the rate of contribution, uh, but that would be covered under the voluntary uh, contributions that I mentioned. So I think that those are the changes that we need to make. 
Uh, the other changes that we need to make, obviously, would be on the systems itself or how we manage this. Um, and then finally, also on the investment side, uh, currently we, the risk of investment falls with the member because uh, it is uh, what we call a provident fund uh, with a lump sum. Uh, should we introduce uh, benefits that work like uh, a pension fund, then we need to uh, see how those cash flows will be uh, required in order to continuously uh, for example, index the amount that is paid out as a pension, uh, how much amount would be paid out for however long the people live, and so on and so forth. So that's a different business model that we need to put in place and that we currently do not run. And uh, those are some of the changes that we need to. And obviously, we need to hire some new people to help us in introducing some of these new products. Then there is the bull in the house of procurement these long chain of procurement procedures which have always been a big bottleneck for you for in terms of investment i'm happy that you they are proposing some changes on empowering the board but i want to see how it will work out in terms of you know reducing the bureaucracy of procurement you you make a very very good point um at this stage because we are uh, a government uh, entity, we've got to follow the PPDA uh, rules. Uh, that means that um, if you are purchasing a pen, you would need to go through the same hoops of uh, investing in a company, or you would need to go through the same hoops of purchasing land to invest in. And that means that the rules that were created for procurement of a pen do not fit the rules of investing. One of the things we've tried to do is to seek for accreditation from the PPDA. So for example, today when we invest in bonds, we do not need to go through a procurement a process that is governed by the PPDA because we've got accreditation. When we invest in securities, uh, we do not need to go through the procurement process uh, that is governed by the PPDA. However, should we wish to invest in land and also to, say, hire a contractor, we still need to go through those rules. So one of the things we've been trying to drive with the PPDA and with the Ministry of Finance, because they uh, are the uh, ministry that looks after procurement and also the ones that govern the NSSF, is to see if we can improve on the, uh, uh, the accreditation so that it covers all sectors of investments within the fund. It is hard work, um, but we hope that as part of the review of the law, uh, the NSSF will be given special treatment to be able to deal with um, procurement of uh, investment assets uh, so that we do not have to go through the same hoop that currently bede uh, bedevils and uh, lengthens the process for investments. A couple of other questions that have come in uh, online. There's one from Nyakahi, Nyakahema, Robert. Is it possible for government to amend the act to allow one access their benefits when unemployed? Um, this is not one that has been included within the changes. Um, however, the benefit that we believe might be able to help people who are unemployed, is to give them a payment, maybe three months, to help them look for a new job. Uh, but don't forget that you do not want to uh, deplete the savings of a member uh, when they are due to retire. So the most important thing is to preserve those savings so that when you get to the age of 50, 55, 60, you still have sufficient money within the port to be able to retire. There is one from Rachel Agaba. When are midterm benefits starting for people saving with NSSF? I believe they will start uh, as soon as the NSSF Act is amended. There is another one from uh, Dennis or both. Why doesn't the fund give members in private business their benefits? I think we've sort of dealt with that. 
Um, benefits are meant to help you in retirement. Benefits are not, helped, are not meant to help you to invest. However, midterm access is meant to help you acquire a building asset, uh, a home, and we think that that is much better equity than helping you to go into business because we've established that lots of people, when they go into business with their savings uh, from retirement, they tend not to be able to preserve them and therefore they get into retirement after they've exhausted all their savings. So we would like to at least preserve some amount of money for our members so that when they go into retirement, regardless of their circumstances during the period of work, i.e. whether they went, they kept into regular employment, went into business, so that when they retire, they will have a port of savings that will help them, especially when they have run out of money to be able to, uh, uh, to, to work. The next question is from Alex Moli Wabio. Kindly, the board should reduce the years from 55 to 45. Um, I honestly do not believe that Ugandans are living a lot uh, shorter. I think Ugandans are living longer. The age of um, retirement is currently uh, 60 within the public service. Um, the life expectancy has been uh, increased to 63 years. Uh, so the, the number of 45 uh, is not backed up by any scientific um, response. In fact, you'll find that in many countries around the world, they are increasing their retirement age rather than reducing them because, because of the advancement in science, the advancement in health, the advancement in lifestyle. Uh, people are li living a lot longer. And uh, I believe that um, Ugandans uh, are also following that trend. And I think that uh, I, it doesn't make any um, actuarial sense uh, or uh, scientific sense or uh, even evidential sense to be able to uh, reduce the year uh, for uh, retirement. The next question is from Isaac Seguia. I suggest that NSF helps its members with meaningful savings to acquire assets like land or houses because these are the major things we work for in life. I believe that the midterm access will be able to do that. Samuel Doto, Do, Doto I think, uh, that's pronounced well. Why does the government want tax benefits? Okay, I haven't talked about tax, um, you recall, and that's because the government hasn't yet pronounced itself. Uh, on uh, the tax element. Um, however, let me talk a little bit about what happens at the present. Today, um, you as an employer, a member of the fund, you are taxed on your income before you make that contribution of 5%. The company or the employer that pays your contribution is not taxed on the 10% that is currently uh, paid into your account. The NSSF is currently taxed at the rate of 30% uh, corporation tax on the income that the fund makes that is then given to the members as interest. And finally, the member is not taxed on their benefit. If you sort of work out those numbers, the tax that government collects from the employee <coughs> and the fund um, is would be less than the tax that they would collect uh, should they only tax the benefit. But more importantly, the member's benefit would be a lot higher than the current arrangement. So one of the proposals that we've made with, to government is that the regime of tax should be changed from an E- um, e, T, T to E, uh, E to an E, 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 T. A little bit confusing, but basically it means that exempt the contribution, exempt the member uh, employer contribution, exempt the, tax, uh, the, the revenue of the uh, 
scheme, NSSF, but tax the benefit. Um, the end result is that the employer and the employee and the tax revenue authorities would have a better uh, benefit than the current arrangement. And if you talk to many of the schemes in the world, you'll find that the current regime was stopped many, many years ago. So we believe that if government introduces a new tax on the benefits and drops the tax currently it charges on the member contribution and also reduces the tax that is charged or removes the tax that is charged on the scheme, I honestly believe that government will be in a much better position, the member will be in a much better position, the employers will be in a much better position with the new tax regime. Yeah, my name is Malcolm from NTV Business. I have uh, two little questions. If you look at competition today, compared, um, like as it is today, why would, for instance, voluntary servers uh, save with NSSF? And another question, uh, I don't know whether I need you to touch on this again. Um, if at all you have uh, talked about it, but I'd like to bring another angle on lending to government because the law would then open up space for the fund to lend to government. We, we know that government, um, we are heavily indebted. We are even about to fail to pay our own debt. It's highly risky. So how would you then trust uh, uh, that government will really pay back with this heavy lot already, which is uh, seeming to be uh, a heavy burden going out of, uh, out of control? Thank you very much. Yeah, very good questions. Uh, let me first of all start off with the voluntary contribution and why would be um, why NSF would be a better investment than um, the other schemes. First of all, if you look at the returns we've been giving to our members, uh, we've given a target benchmark return of uh, 200 basis points or 2 percentage points above 10-year uh, inflation. So we've been paying a real rate of return to our members, number one. Number two uh, is the ease of access of your money. Um, currently, uh, we've introduced technology to be able to allow our members to really uh, interact with their s s uh, savings um, on a very regular basis. And we think that um, we've increased the transparency, uh, we've increased the governance structure around the NSSF, and therefore this entity, which is now one of the best run uh, social security institutions within the region uh, is giving you a, a good service, is giving you a good return, uh, is transparent, you, we involve the member in the management, um, we take feedback from our members, people who've got good ideas, we take those ones, we drive innovation. So as an institution, we've really, really, really improved the way we do our business and the, the benefits of that are to the member through a higher return and the fact that their money is safe and, uh, and sound. Number two is the whole governance uh, structure around the NSSF Act, which is basically the fact that because we are set up by government, the government of Uganda underwrites the risk. If you are uh, saving with a private pension scheme, um, you are basically dealing with an entity that is uh, run by private individuals or shareholders and therefore the risk of um, the fund going down uh, and not paying you back your money is real and present because obviously it's the private sector. So at least you know that with the NSSF it is guaranteed by government uh, and that should the scheme fail then big brother government should be able to come back and uh, pay you your money. Um, Number three, and I think that to me is the most important one, is the fact that by investing in NSSF, you are investing in a scheme that is interested in the development of Uganda. Uh, we've talked about 70% of our investments being in uh, government bonds uh, of Uganda. These government bonds are invested in things like um, uh, dams, invested in things like roads, 
invested in things like um, you know the investments that are going to come in the oil sector all these come out of the investment that government is borrowing from the the, the, the domestic savings in order to invest here so by investing your money in NSSF you are basically investing here if you are investing in a private uh, fund um, they will their first their first investment uh, procedure is obviously to make sure that they give, uh, get a good return but they will not be patriotic and I believe that by investing in the NSSF you are being patriotic you are investing in your country and at the end of the day I believe that um, we are all building Uganda uh, and we can only do that through our own domestic savings if you look at the rest of the countries in the world look at the uh, the Asian tigers they've built their countries using pension funds if you want to invest in real estate if you want to invest in uh, companies uh, their stock exchanges these have largely been built uh, through pension funds so that's why I think that it's within uh, it's within our best interest as Ugandans to build our own scheme and make it um, uh, significant in the way that we run our country and we give a return to our people which then brings me on nicely to the question that was asked by Malcolm around uh, government uh, borrowing I honestly believe that if you look at the numbers I think uh, government has borrowed uh, about 35 38 percent uh, of gross domestic uh, product um, and uh, they've been looking at a, a limit of about 50 percent uh, uh, as a, a sort of a limit and of course once the big uh, oil projects come on board that number will be will be tied but you are looking at a country that has used its resources uh, before the discovery of oil now we we believe that with the, the discovery of oil and the resources that will come arising out of that that should be able to increase the GDP of the country and therefore should give the country a little bit of more scope to be able to borrow um, and finally I would like to say that um, there is no country there's no country worth its salt that would uh, renegade on its domestic debt or even on its foreign debt because that would completely uh, kill the country uh, financially and I don't think that people like the World Bank, the IMF, and uh, all the other international agencies would continue to do business with a country that has defaulted on its domestic debt. So I think that it's within the interest of government to ensure that they continue to, like, to pay their debt. And I think that that capability of paying their debt would be enhanced, especially with the discovery of oil. And I think that that's what makes uh, this time um, exciting for both the NSSF uh, having a bigger mandate and also the country at large to be able to increase on the amount of things that we can do as a nation to make our country a lot better than it has been in the past. All right, we've now got a couple of uh, questions coming off uh, Twitter. One from uh, Raymond Mujuni. What regulatory measures do you suggest in its place in order to check the investment decisions. And I believe that these decisions was to be on the... Obviously, um, if you talk about regulation, there is a regulator that currently um, regulates the pension sector. Uh, it's the Uganda Regulatory uh, Retirements and Regulatory Authority uh, that uh, is uh, running uh, with uh, regulating us. They have come up with um, rules and regulations, for example, on um, where we can invest in terms of uh, our strategic asset allocation. Um, they've also looked at uh, um, some of the, uh, the things we need to involve uh, with, um, uh, you know, we, we can't have an exposure in things like um, green fields, uh, private equity, we've got to have a small exposure. We cannot have exposures outside of the East African region. Our investments have to be here. So there is a lot of work that the regulator has been able to do in um, making sure that um, even if we have uh, our fund managers internally investing, uh, there is uh, a lot of things that they've got to do in order to be able to meet the rules and regulations that have been, uh, 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 have been set up by the regulator. Don't also forget that um, 
we are also governed by the International Social Security Association. Uh, they have rules and regulations that uh, they uh, share with us. Uh, our regulator belongs to uh, an international body of regulators, so there's a lot of best practice that is shared. So in terms of uh, reducing the risk uh, of investment, uh, I think there is plenty for us to share with the rest of the world in order not to repeat some of the mistakes that the other schemes might have made and lost money during the financial crisis of 2008. There's another question from uh, Samuel <coughs> Kawalia. Is it only me who thinks that the proposed amendments in the NSF Act are 80% beneficial to the fund more than the people that save with it? Actually, I actually thought the amendments are to be on the saver's side. I don't get that sense. Uh, if you look at the big changes that are coming, um, let's look at the governance structure. Governance is all about the members. You know, if you have a not too good a governance structure, the members will be affected. If you look at the uh, benefits that are going to be imp imp implemented, those are for the members. If you look at the voluntary contributions that will be allowed, those will allow members to have more benefits. Uh, if you look at um, allowing in-house uh, expertise, that's going to increase efficiencies. The benefits of that go to the members. If you look at allowing government uh, to borrow, that benefit goes to the members because ultimately government is able to borrow locally and um, improve the environment in which the members live and work. So I would say that a lot of the changes are to make us more efficient. A lot of the changes are to make us more nimble. And I believe that those changes will definitely benefit our member a lot better than the NSSF. Um, I have uh, one quick question. First of all, uh, I think as an individual and as a shareholder um, in, in you know, a number of companies that, that are on the stock exchange, I think NSSF is doing a wise thing to invest in there. However, my worry is, one, the saving culture in Uganda is, is fairly poor. Um, Ugandans save no more than 10% of their earnings. So well over 90% is consumed. I kind of worry that while NSSF is doing all these awesome things, we might be spending a lot of resource and energy and time to make Ugandan save very little. Yeah. So as as um, you know, NSSF are there. Is there a plan to first of all, you know, ignite that savings culture before you even tell people to save to encourage them to have you know various sources of income? People are worried about taxation. There is million taxes coming your way and yet you are supposed to save. Don't you think Ugandans struggle with that? That's a very good question. So let me give you the numbers. There are 15 million Ugandans who work or who are in formal employment. I mean who are, sorry, who can work. Um, there are about 4 million who work in the formal sector. That means there is 11 million who work in the informal sector. Of the 4 million who work in the, inf in the formal sector, only 50% of them save with the NSSF. So there is 2 million of those, uh, and if you remove about half a million who work for government, that means there's 1.5 million who don't save with NSSF and in no other scheme. Uh, and then there's 11 million who, uh, sa who are informal and therefore who do not have any other form of long-term saving scheme. What this law will enable us to do is now to offer an opportunity to the 11 million and the 1.5 million to now save because the law will allow us to increase our net to those people. We've seen, as you've correctly said, that Ugandans don't like to save. The only way Ugandans can save is almost by a forced saving. And we believe that this law, which is going to force individuals to make voluntary contributions over and above what they currently save, and also to save um, extra for those who have not been saving at all into a long-term scheme like NSSF. That would mean that effectively, 
the numbers that we currently uh, are complaining about of less than 10% uh, who save, hopefully that should be able to increase. And it should be able to increase because it will be um, beneficial for them to save with the NSSF. Because NSSF has demonstrated that when you save with the NSSF, you get a good return, there is a good governance structure around NSSF, there are good products that NSF is promoting, NSF is investing in the economy, the economy is creating the jobs, and the jobs are now beginning to create uh, people who then begin to save. So it's a self-satisfying uh, self uh, uh, model, which means that the more we save, the better for the nation, and the better for the nation, we can then invest this money that we've saved into enterprises so that we make them permanent. I think for me the tragedy of Uganda is the fact that we only have about 12 counters uh, on the stock exchange. For a population that has 40 million people, for a population that has had s about 600,000 SMEs that are registered with the Uganda Registration Services Bureau, it is a shame that only 12 companies have come onto the stock exchange to be able to raise capital. I think that we need to turn these small SMEs that people start into big enterprises so that they can live beyond those individuals who start them. And the only way we can guarantee them is by listing them, by them raising money on the, and also helping our individuals to invest in those companies so that it becomes a culture that if you want to acquire wealth, not only should you invest in uh, real estate, as I've seen a lot of Ugandans do, but let's also invest in companies because not all of us can start an S a small SME. Not all of us can start a supermarket in our, in our area. But if we have a big supermarket and we can all invest in it, then we own that piece of investment. If you look at Umeme uh, as a very good example, Umeme was a company that was started by a, a private equity fund that came from abroad and invested in the distribution of electricity. Uh, it then divested and sold shares to Ugandans and NSSF. So now Umeme is a company that's owned by Ugandans and we distribute our own electricity. So for me, that, that is the success story of capitalism. And I think that what we need to do is to, by increasing the amount of savers for NSSF, we can also increase the amount of investment pools uh, investment money so that these assets, you know, one, one of the examples I always like to say is, for example, why hasn't people like MTN listed? So that, you know, if you look at Safaricom in, in Kenya, they're the largest uh, uh, investment on the stock exchange. And that is a mobile phone company where everybody now is a consumer but is also a shareholder. And that's the opportunity that we need to give to our citizens so that we can buy these big companies. My name is Samson. Uh, mine is a, a question regarding um, uh, lack of products, especially that help um, uh, savers who want to be phone owners. I mean, um, home owners. I have not heard about uh, uh, this since uh, days of Unsimbe and uh, and and that that land in Wakiso. Uh, it, it seems uh, most of the houses that are actually are being offered are quite expensive for normal saver so uh, i don't know if if you plan in in future to include that in in your portfolio okay so this is an exciting p uh, point for us actually um we have got uh four big projects around real estate that the fund is currently running and of those uh, three of them are uh, for the re would be what i would call categorize residential so if you look at uh, loboa uh, we're building in about 5,000 units uh, in about 10 years. Uh, so releasing about 500 units per, per phase, with each phase lasting about three years, and then reinvesting that amount of money. That is meant for the middle to sort of higher end of the market. But if you look at places like uh, Temangalo, where again we are looking at about 3,500 units, uh, and if you look at a place like Insimbe, where we are looking at least about 10,000 units. Those would be middle sort of to lower um, uh, income uh, properties. And we also recognize that a lot of our members uh, who, would, uh, who have money with us, 
uh, who would, uh, if they had this money in a bank, for example, they would be able to leverage on this money to actually get the mortgages. So we, we are looking at coming up with a product uh, once the law has been amended to enable our members to basically own houses through an arrangement which we will basically call rent to own. So people can rent those properties but eventually own them uh, and using some of the money that they currently have with us uh, as a sort of a backup uh, security uh, within there. That will uh, hopefully generate and stimulate the market, uh, allow our members to own houses uh, using the savings that they've used, but also uh, allowing them the flexibility of uh, paying a rent type uh, uh, investment uh, that will result them in having own, own ownership. And we believe that um, when we begin the uh, implementation of these projects, uh, we will be able to um, uh, drive the mortgage market and hopefully uh, increase uh, the products that are available for the local Ugandan, but also give an advantage to our members uh, who've been able to save with us. One more question, uh, yes. Just wondering, just wa uh, must one have a problem like maybe serious illness for them to access their benefits? Uh, today, uh, and why does the fund dictate the ground on which one can access funds? I don't think we, be, we dictate that. Uh, that is determined by uh, medical advice. Um, I think our doctors are very fair. The fund has no say in that. Uh, we've set criteria uh, for our doctors to be able to, uh, to uh, recommend. And uh, doctors will normally um, uh, advise us on which invalidity uh, to pay our benefit on. So I don't think it's a, a dictation by, by the fund. It's actually scientifically done by doctors who determine that this member is no longer able to work, or is uh, incapacitated, or is, uh, is, uh, is invalid enough not to be able to. And don't forget that today we even allow people who are still working, who perhaps need a major operation that will allow them to continue working, to actually get part of their savings to help them. And I think that's a fair way of dealing with uh, the invalidity benefit. So welcome once again. Um, the fund is growing. We have seen even across the law um, that intends to open up space for government now tomorrow. And, and that, that, that's an indication that it has grown by leaps and bounds. But there's this old age concern that um, the fund continues to give less return on investment, yet uh, it remains a near monopoly. Maybe I, I didn't want to shoot the discussion with you, but maybe you could give me an honest answer. The on what would you say? The honest answer is first of all, let me give you some numbers just to give you context. If you look at the total government domestic debt, NSSF already contributes 40% of that. So government already is borrowing quite a lot from NSSF. And therefore, if you look at the roads that they are doing, if you look at the bridges, all the things that government borrows to do, we are contributing 40% of that, number one. Number two, how do you assess the return of a fund that you've invested in? The biggest thing that any pension fund is fighting against is called inflation. Inflation is the number that tells you how much value the currency, not the currency, the, uh, the, the value of money is losing uh, in a year. So for example, if the rate of inflation was 10%, that means that the shilling you're holding today uh, is now worth 90, sh 100 shillings that you were holding today is now worth 10 and uh, nine shillings, sorry, nine, 90 shillings, because it's lost 10% of its value. So your, our benchmark, it can only be inflation. Now, we have always shared this number. The inflation is done by an external party. 
NSSF does not get involved in determining the rate of inflation. We have decided that in order not to use a short-term measure, we use the 10-year inflation rate. And we average that over the period. And the reason is that there will be years when the inflation rate is high, but there will also be years when the inflation rate is low. So if you average out, you're basically smoothing out that volatility in the rate of inflation. So we get that number. We add there 20 basis, 200 basis points or 2 percentage points. So if the rate of inflation on average was 7%, the benchmark becomes 9% because we've added 2 percentage points there. But if you look at that number, we've consistently delivered a return that is much, much higher than that 10 uh, than that 10-year average inflation rate. In fact, we've exceeded the, the, the two percentage points. Last year, it was 3.7% uh, that we exceeded that number. So we will continue to do that, and that's the only measure or benchmark that we can, that we can perform against. I'd also like you to, to look at this. What is the alternative for an investment for any member of the public? The first alternative is to put your money in a bank. If you go to a bank today, they will give you a rate of return on your fixed deposit of at least 6 or 7%, if you're lucky. And that is before the withholding tax of 15%. So that dampens it down to about 5%. So 5%, we offered 11.23% last year. The second area is equities. Okay, what was the growth of the stock exchange last year? I think the growth of the stock exchange was about six or seven or eight percent. So if you had invested in an index of the stock exchange, that is what the return you'd have got. That was certainly a lot lower than the rate of 11.23 percent that we offered. The third investment you'd go to is real estate. Now, real estate, of course, depends on where you've invested. All right, if you invested in retail, the retail market the returns in the retail market are perhaps a little bit higher than what you'd get in commercial property or even residential property. So, but if you look at those returns and you look at the wide swings you've had in the real estate market, you'll be lucky to get a return, a net return of 11.23% uh, per annum. That means that in terms of investment, because we've been able to get a blend of all those investments, um, we've been able to give a better return um, than you could possibly get in those individual asset classes that I've mentioned. And that's why I believe it's much, much better to invest your money in NSSF than really to invest it in the other asset classes, especially if you don't have the expertise to do so. All right. Uh, my name is Marietti. In regards to borrowing the government, uh, what plans does NSSF have uh, in case of abuse, delayed payment, default, things like that? Okay. The only plan we have is obviously to take government to court, but I'm sure that will not happen. Um, I honestly believe that government has a big responsibility to meet its obligations, especially if it has gone through a financial instrument that has been gone through the central bank. Um, and the example I always give is that there is no country in the world uh, that I believe has ever defaulted on its debt. Um, many countries, what they do is that they may delay in the payments, but eventually they pay. Um, the other thing that the governments do is that they perhaps take discounts, which means that they will reduce on the interest rate that they're actually paying to us. Uh, but in all honesty, I don't believe that the Ugandan government, at this stage in its development, will default on its debt because that would have huge implications. That means that there would be no FDI coming in here. That would mean that they would be blacklisted for doing businesses. That means that contracts will be canceled. There are a lot of international contracts that the government has to undertake. There are so many implications. No government that is worth its salt. And I don't think this government, I think, is much smarter than, than, with, than, than we would give it credit for. But I think that there would be no government that would really um, not be able to invest uh, or to meet its obligations. Um, let's return to the very uh, sticky issue of liberalizing of the sector. 
Um, many saw this amendment and the proposals by government as a way to quieten the discussion that was already opening up um, around opening up the uh, sector, pension sector. Um, however, uh, there, there is those critics who actually argue that you actually are the drafters of these amendments as a fund and um, that they are meant to protect the fund from competition. Your take. Yes. <laughs> um, the truth of the matter is that um, having been at the fund for the last seven years, Having been involved in the decisions um, that uh, and the discussions that have been going on with regard to uh, liberalizing the sector, having met with other experienced uh, practitioners in the industry, having benchmarked to other countries uh, within Africa and outside of Africa, it is very obvious that all countries, that most jurisdictions, will have a basic mandatory pension scheme as a minimum. And the reasons are pretty obvious. Pension industry is not like any other industry, uh, your telecos, your financials, your banking, where um, you can let the forces of market forces run with it. Pensions tend to be a public good. There is that need to ensure that when Richard Biarugaba retires at the age of 60, he has been investing for the last 30 years in a pension. And when I get to that age of 60, the money is not there. Because I invested in a private pension scheme, financial, uh, the financial market collapsed in 2008, all my assets were written off, and suddenly the pension company can no longer meet those obligations that have been accumulating over these years. That's why pension is, you know, pensions has brought down governments. If you look at South America, uh, Chile to be specific, they privatized the pension schemes in the 80s when that was a big deal for the World Bank and the IMF. They recommended that let's privatize pensions. But now they are rolling back all that because they have noticed that the private sector, with its good intentions, with its innovation, with its efficiencies, still you are subject to market forces. And market forces means that you might lose those investments. And when you lose those investments, it doesn't matter how good you were, it doesn't matter how efficient you were, those investments are gone. So that's why you need to have a minimum. And that's why if you look at the laws, the, 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 the amendments, the, the resolution was that NSSF should be retained as the basic national scheme. <coughs> so yes, it is basic. Let's allow individuals to invest in NSSF as a basic minimum. If they've got more s money they want to invest, let them go to the private sector schemes so that they can do voluntary contributions to those ones. But the basic, the minimum, the, the one that allows everybody at least to have something by the time they retire, let that one be managed by a government institution that is guaranteed by government because it's actually the role of government if somebody retires and they do not have a social security protection uh, measure that government will have to undertake that right look at the the surge that currently is being given to the old people it's because government has a responsibility to its old people and that's why they're saying let somebody have a, that responsibility the employer the employee to make sure that they invest in that scheme and it's a basic minimum. So I don't mind the um, I don't mind the sector being liberalized, but let us liberalize the voluntary space. The the what you'd call the basic space should be left to the a government scheme and NSSF is the best 
to be able to do that. And I think that's what this law is all about. There is a question that has come in from Paul Busharizi, and it says, the real estate projects you are working on, first priority to purchase will be to your members. How will this work? If a house costs 100 million and I have saved that with NSSF, can I just use all my savings to pay? Uh, Paul, you will not use all your savings to pay, but what you'll be able to do is that that will indicate to us that should everything else fail, you have a backup plan to be able to use your savings to pay. So we will give you a priority uh, in making that acquisition, either through a product with a mortgage bank or through uh, our own product, which we are going to introduce that I mentioned, of rent to own. So you'll get that priority because we know you have the ability to pay should you uh, fail to have sufficient income uh, to pay off uh, that liability. There's a question to David Mwonge. Uh, good afternoon, Richard. Talking about investments and development of Uganda, is the scheme going to show interest in funding the process of the Ginger, Kampala Ginger Expressway following the opening of the PPA bidding process? by UNRWA. The quick answer is we are looking. Uh, we have been in discussions with them. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but the Africa Development Bank uh, is in the process of um, arranging the finance. And that finance uh, will come in two formats. Uh, the first format will be through a bond. And the second format will be through equity participation. Um, uh, depending on the risks and the benefits, uh, we would look at either investing in both the equity and the debt or um, just investing in the debt, uh, which is the bond element. But uh, that is something that we, we are looking at. Okay. Uh, generally, many Ugandans agree that customer care, big problem. Everywhere, across private, formal sector, I mean. But NSSF has done a lot of work in that space, improving customer care, customer relations. And uh, I want to commend you personally, um, because generally the situation on the ground has improved. You interact better with your customers across regardless of their social class. And uh, you've also made it easier for people to contribute through mobile money, through mobile, I mean, commercial banks, and so on and so forth. So I, I want to know the lessons you've learned over, you know, through your innovations and whether you would need legal support to make it even better for the customer. Okay, so the question I was hoping you would ask is, uh, what you call it, yeah? But anyway. <laughs> Thank you so much, first of all, for the compliment. Um, those who know me personally will know that um, uh, one of the things that I tell my staff uh, at the fund and even before I um, joined the fund, uh, the companies where I worked, I told them that um, the most important person is the customer, but everybody says that. But I also take it further and I say that um, as a member of staff, as an individual who works for the company, for the fund, um, I will, I, I might not fire you if you make an error in processing. I might not fire you if you lose the fund money. But if you lose the fund a customer through bad customer service, I will definitely fire you. And that's how important I take customer service. Uh, I think that the most important person to any organization is the customer. And in our particular case, it is our members and their uh, employers. So all the energy, all the innovation we've undertaken is to ensure that our customer has the best experience. Today, we get about, about 12,000 customers who come to see us uh, every week. And of those, 42% come to see us through the branches. So that means they interact with us on and on. And we think that the rest who are 58% interact with us through our electronic channels. And that shows you that 
we've been able to give them convenience because our electronic channels means that anywhere you are, you can get in touch with us and uh, enjoy a reasonable service like you are. So we've imp we improved our branches, we've improved our good feel, the good feel factor, we've refurbished our branches, the look and feel. Uh, we've been able to train our staff, we've been able to drive the ethos of um, being a customer-centric organization. Innovation, innovation, innovation is going to continue. Uh, Self-service is one of our big deals. Um, currently, the 42% who come to see us in our branches, about 38% uh, of those uh, come here to either claim a benefit or come here to register. We want to make sure that in the future, maybe a year from now, we should be able to let people um, register themselves, claim for their benefits in the comfort of their homes so that we can improve, improve that experience. So we will be able to do that, we will continue to do that and uh, continue to watch the space as we drive the whole customer service experience. One more thing, um, we are already using machine learning and artificial intelligence to uh, learn how our customers interact with us so that we can begin even to anticipate. For example, we can now tell how many people are coming to claim their benefits uh, and therefore we put there enough time for them to be able to process their benefit and put their resources in place. So we will continue to use all the technology and innovation to make sure that our customers feel good. And um, yeah, all I can say is watch this space as we continue to improve the experience of our customers. Thank you so much. We've talked a lot today. Um, as I summarize our session, I'd like to tell you that the new law uh, will be like removing shackles on our innovation agenda. We have wanted to do a lot more with our customers. We haven't been able to do that because the NSSF Act is very, very well defined. It tells us how we should breathe, how we should um, stop breathing, and how we should continue to eat and so on and so forth. But hopefully with the new law, we should be able to find new ways of breathing, new ways of walking, new ways of eating, and new ways of making our customers feel like they enjoy our experience and also saving for their retirement and preparing for um, that journey that all of us go through of coming to the end of our working life and hopefully getting a port that will help them the rest of their lives. And we really like to welcome all of our members and all the other stakeholders on this journey as we continue to make NSSF the security provider of choice. Thank you.